when employees come to you and try to ask for accommodations, they have gone through so much thoughts uh, already that when you are trying, when you kind of question it or ask for more details, um, then now the the employee feel that oh next time. I need to have more details. I need to justify my accommodations, right? And that's the worst because when you have to, when you keep feeling like you have to justify, it doesn't feel like it's being inclusive environment, but uh, it feels you're kind of being forced to disclose your disability and more information. Welcome to the Workology Podcast, a podcast for the disruptive workplace leader. Join host Jessica Miller Merrill, founder of Workology.com, as she sits down and gets to the bottom of trends, tools, and case studies for the business leader, HR, and recruiting professional who is tired of the status quo. Now here's Jessica with this episode of Workology. This episode of the Workology podcast is part of our Future of Work series powered by Pete, the Partnership on Employment and Accessible Technology. Pete works to start conversations around how emerging workplace technology trends are impacting people with disabilities. This podcast is powered by ACE the HR Exam and Upskill HR. These are two of the courses that I offer for certification prep and recertification for HR leaders. Before I introduce our guest, I want to hear from you. Text the word podcast to 512 548 3005 to ask questions, leave comments, and make suggestions for future guests. This is my community text number, and I want to hear from you. Today, I'm joined by Albert Kim, accessibility consultant, trainer, and founder of Accessibility Next Gen. Albert worked as a UX accessibility lead at Corn Ferry and accessibility subject matter expert at ServiceNow Design System Team to achieve digital accessibility beyond the legal compliance. He's also an active public speaker advocating for neurodiversity and mental health inclusion in digital accessibility work. Albert, welcome to the Workology podcast. Thank you for having me. Um, it's good to be here. It is. I'm so excited for you to talk to us about this topic. But first, before we chat more, talk to us a little bit about your background and how it led to the work that you're doing now. I work as a digital accessibility subject matter expert and a UX design consultant and trainer. I'm also a public speaker and, and coach uh, raising mental health awareness in the tech community. I founded a, a community called Accessibility in Action to help people who are trying to learn more about accessibility. Um, I was also a disability and next gen leader. Currently, I'm serving as a, an invited expert at the uh, W3C Worldwide Web uh, Consortium with their uh, Cognitive and Learning Disabilities Task Force team and uh, mental health subgroup. So the way I got into uh, my work is I, I myself identify as someone with disability. Uh, I'm, I'm neurodivergent. Uh, I also have mental health conditions. And it comes from my environmental background. I, I was born in a family uh, with domestic violence and uh, my parents have never gotten any formal education. Uh, being first generation to live, live in America, Asian, being an Asian, um, coming from Asian culture. I'm also a military. So having said that, all those uh, environmental factors uh, kind of contributed, including my genetic factors uh, to my current um, uh, conditions. Um, and I really, really wanted to advocate uh, for people uh, like me Something that I realized as, as a neurodivergent uh, person is that some digital products kind of, uh, they are like very crucial for me um, in my daily life. Uh, it helps me a lot. It, it enables me to uh, live and function uh, well. So in my life and work and career and everything. But um, what I realized is that a lot of uh, the product owners or, or the people who are actually making these digital think about the impact. They don't really um, realize the uh, full product potential of how their products can actually help. So I knew that um, I wanted to pursue something in, in tech and wanted to uh, advocate 
for uh, people like me, uh, users like me. And so I got into digital accessibility, which was perfect fit. And um, I uh, advocate uh, for users who are, are neurodivergent or uh, people who are, uh, have disabilities um, in, in this field. And um, I'm, I, I consider my job as, as, a, jo as a, a person who connects the producers of digital products uh, to the consumers uh, or the users. Um, all users, not just abled users, but all users, and trying to help uh, producers of digital products fully realize the product potential. And another thing is that, you know, um, I use all these really cool digital pro product and um, I sometimes uh, I want to share something that I wrote down in my note, for example, digital uh, notes app, um, but it may be inaccessible for my friends uh, who are blind or who are, who are deaf. So it's, it's kind of frustrating uh, to see that, um, that I really love this product and I, I you know, write down, I use it daily and I wanna share that with my friend, but it's not possible because it's not accessible. So it also helps me uh, working in this field to um, not only um, include uh, neurodivergent and people like me, but also uh, people with other disabilities. Um, it helps me to advocate for them as well. Thank you, Albert, for sharing your story and, and kind of talking us through the why behind why you, you do what you do. I, I think that sometimes as HR leaders, we're busy with strategy and planning that uh, we sometimes forget about the human, uh, but behind the activities that, that help run and support the business. I want to switch gears just a little bit and ask you about disability disclosure. So what does disclosing a disability at work look like for people with invisible disabilities? So from the very beginning of joining the work, I worry about, oh, should I disclose my disability? Is that going to impact the interview process? Uh, is that going to put me on, on a disadvantage um, in this interview process? So that's the kind of uh, worries that I always have um, when I apply for different companies. And then after joining uh, the work, I worry about um, will teammates accept me uh, as, as, as their team uh, member? And will, will I be included? Will I fit in, possibly? And the worry about this is, I, I guess, not not only just the uh, disabled uh, employee, but also any employee can have this kind of feeling, but it's more intensified because of the stigma uh, that is around in society towards people with uh, disabilities. And also, when you join the company, mo for me, I, I do need an accommodation right, uh, to be able to perform um, and, and, and access uh, uh, the work uh, place. Um, but sometimes it's very challenging for me to ask for accommodations, especially as a person with invisible disability, right, because um, my disability is not, it's not visible. So uh, maybe the manager or HR or uh, other coworkers may not, um, oh, like you look fine to me. Oh, like why do you need an accommodation or something like that, you know? And trust me that this actually happened in, in the past for me. I think as an employee with uh, invisible disability, I'm always kind of subconsciously worried and thinking about how will other employees perceive me and conscious about how people will think. Are they gonna think that I'm very needy uh, or um, will, I, will my accommodations be uh, handled in the proper way or uh, things like that? Um, or people will not take me seriously anymore uh, and thinking that I'm slacking off because my disability is not visible outside and maybe they think that I'm just taking advantage or something or making things up. So these are the real kind of... Uh, concerns 
that go through, especially employees with mental health conditions, right? Uh, I myself have uh, ADHD, uh, depression, anxiety, uh, OCD, and PTSD, all diagnosed, and I've been getting therapies and uh, medication for decades, right? Um, and I have a team of doctors that support me in the uh, supported me in in that process, but still, there's a huge lack of understanding towards uh, mental health conditions, mental health disability, right? Uh, in in society, people still don't really understand what mental health is. Sometimes something that I also worry about is, will I be forced to disclose my disability? Um, and oftentimes, uh, I may not feel comfortable yet disclosing my disability to my coworkers or other teammates, but especially in the beginning when first joining the team, but I'm kind of forced to do that in, in a way because I need an accommodation. Um, you know, that, that whole, whole realistic, uh, whole reality of um, challenges uh, kind of adds on to uh, more tall, adds more tall to uh, my mental health conditions. Is there anything you wish employers or HR professionals knew about maybe how they can create a more supportive and inclusive environment for their employees, especially when we're thinking about those invisible, but also uh, visible disabilities? We want to help employees feel more comfortable disclosing. Yeah, I think one of the things they can do is, I think, um, being upfront about accommodations that are available or just being upfront that accommodations are available and letting, letting employees know and asking, always asking, uh, do you need any accommodations? Do you need accommodations? Please let me know. Um, we we'll, would we'll be more than happy to accommodate. And setting such tone of voice uh, and being upfront about accommodations first before your employees bring it up kind of helps create a inclusive uh, environment where you feel employees feel more inclined to disclose and more comfortable to disclose and um, ask for accommodations, right? And another thing is that uh, when employees ask for accommodations, try not to uh, ask for more, like too much more details. Because oftentimes when I'm asking for accommodation, I already feel a lot of, uh, I've already gone through a lot of inner, inner thinking process and, and uh, conversations. Oh, will this accommodations be accepted? When employees come to you and try to ask for accommodations, they have gone through so much thoughts uh, already that when you are trying, when you kind of question it or ask for more details, um, then now the, the employee feel that, oh, next time I need to have more details. I need to justify my accommodations, right? And that's the worst because when you have to, when you keep feeling like you have to justify, it doesn't feel like it's being inclusive environment, but uh, it feels you're kind of, being forced to disclose your disability and more information, right? Um, so making sure to train managers uh, to on how to accommodate employees with disabilities uh, and, and the kind of conversation uh, narrative that you should need to have is very important. And another way to kind of protect the privacy of employees with disability is uh, having a like a central place where employees can ask for accommodations or uh, disclose disability once, and then rather than having to disclose it to every single employee that you meet or coworkers you meet whenever you need accommodations, rather than doing that, you just uh, because you've disclosed it once to the central place, uh, whether that is HR, um, you just have that accommodations without having to disclose your disability all the time. And the HR or that central place can be, uh, can be the uh, reference source, right? 
uh, yeah, this employee um, has already verified or, or had a doctor's note or uh, has approved the accommodation. So rather than, um, and just giving that uh, assurance so that employees don't have to disclose it constantly. And sometimes just disclosing is a disability self, uh, especially for uh, people with mental health conditions, uh, including PTSD, it can also be traumatizing. You cannot judge, you cannot really generalize a whole disability, like specific disability, like 500 different employees, right? Uh, for example, for OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD can show in many different ways. Oftentimes, media portrays it as super clean or super organized or wash your hands a lot or something like that. But OCD has many different forms. And for me, my OCD is about completion. When I try to, uh, for example, do work or carry on a task, it's hard for me to move on to next task until I feel completely done with my current task. It's actually very serious uh, and debilitating sometimes. So I take medications and things like that. So knowing that, especially in mental health conditions, it's not just one size fits all or, oh, you have OCD, so you must be super clean or organized or something like that. It's very hard to generalize that. And every case is very different, especially in, in, in invisible disability. So you need to be very flexible with your accommodation so that uh, it actually accommodates the employees rather than trying to wear uh, clothes that doesn't really fit you. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that uh, being flexible and uh, making sure uh, that the workplace is uh, inclusive in terms of accommodating those needs. Let's take a reset. This is Jessica Miller Merrill, and you are listening to the Workology Podcast powered by ACE, the HR exam, and Upskill HR. This podcast is part of our Future of Work series with Pete, the Partnership on Employment and Accessible Technology. Today, we are talking with Albert Kim, accessibility consultant, trainer, and founder of Accessibility Next Gen. Before we get back to the podcast, I want to hear from you. Text the word podcast to 512 548 3005. You can ask me questions, leave comments, and make suggestions for future guests. This is my community text number. Yes, I read the text, and I want to hear from you. The Workology Podcast Future of Work series is supported by PEAT, the Partnership on Employment and Accessible Technology. PEAT's initiative is to foster collaboration and action around accessible technology in the workplace. PETA is funded by the U.S. Department of Labor's Office of Disability Employment Policy, ODEP. Learn more about PETE at PETEWORKS.org. That's P-E-A-T-W-O-R-K-S dot org. How can employers set employees with mental health disabilities up for success in the workplace once they have been hired? This is a really good question because oftentimes we focus on hiring more people with uh, disabilities but don't really talk enough about uh, after they are hired and how do we set them up for success. And I think one of the ways, uh, action uh, step that I could recommend is encouraging building employee resource group, building communities within uh, the workplace for people who are neurodivergent or people who have mental health conditions or uh, disabilities, uh, diversity inclusion, This employee resource group will be very, very helpful in the long run in building the culture and making sure that their voice is being heard and they are included in the process of making company policies related to DEI, right? Um, Because you now have a specific group or or resource that you can refer to or you can go uh, seek for um, uh, feedback from, right? And another thing is that new uh, candidates go through an interview process, they might ask you uh, if, uh, oh, is there a employee resource group for uh, employees with uh, neurodivergent employees? And I often ask that. And what really made me feel very comfortable, uh, even from the interview process, was when some HR uh, professionals kind of connected me, helped me connect with someone from their employee resource group and try to 
set a meeting uh, to just talk about different things of working as a neurodivergent employee at their company and uh, just hearing from them, from the actual employee who's working at the company and is neurodivergent, just like me, um, it helps me feel like I don't think I'll feel alone when I'm joining this company, right? Like this is really powerful. So I highly recommend building employee resource group and supporting that. So, and, and it'll go a long way um, uh, so that you can source some um, insights from the group uh, in building uh, onboarding process, uh, building uh, inclusive interview process and uh, things like that. Also mandating diversity and inclusion training for employees when they're onboarding, mandating training on diversity and inclusion and how to work with uh, teammates who are neurodivergent or who have disabilities and basic education on that um, and, and mandating in the pub, company policy to do that is, is very, very important um, because oftentimes you, if you don't mandate that or have that on company policy, it's like good to have. And oftentimes if it's good to have you rather not do it uh, and focus on your actual work uh, rather than, and a lot of times this diversity and inclusion and accessibility is seen as a kind of like extra thing. So it'll never happen, right? They will never get training. So mandating that in the policy and including in company core value, DEI and leadership mentioning and reminding such value in, in all hands meeting can be very powerful. Setting the culture and, and um, also trying to celebrate uh, different awareness month, right? Mental health awareness month and, um, or having a newsletter like diversity and inclusion newsletter is a really good example. And uh, you could ask these different employee resource groups, hey, you know, we, this month is a mental health awareness month and we wanna have, feature some articles on the new, company newsletter uh, for experience of, uh, or raising awareness about mental health, uh, does anyone want to volunteer, right? So this is, is the way uh, you can create an inclusive um, workplace and also set them up for success. And one more, if I were to add just one more, then I'd say peer-to-peer -peer support and mentorship uh, support, right? Um, whether in the employee resource group, a neurodivergent senior get, gets connected to a um, newbie uh, in the company and then kind of mentor, become a mentor. And that's uh, very, very helpful. Um, uh, oftentimes, um, people with disabilities, uh, mental health disabilities lack uh, guidance and support. Uh, so having that kind of uh, mentor is, is a huge relief. Can you talk a bit about your own experience and tools that are helping you succeed in the workplace for us? Thank you for asking that. So what was very crucial for me was um, when I'm onboarding and uh, when I just joined new company or team, oftentimes some companies throw like a bunch of resources at you. And then, uh, oh, you know, these are all the apps, uh, mobile uh, applications and softwares we use and uh, feel free to navigate through and just explore. And that's very challenging for neurodivergent employees, right? Uh, because oftentimes company resources have like loads and loads and loads of documents and it's very complex and complicated and, and, and being introduced to a new environment as a new uh, employee trying to navigate this uncertainty, right? Uncertain world with so much information is already challenging, but you are adding more problem to that, right? So uh, rather than just throwing resources at the employees, uh, uh, trying to build an indexed, well-structured guidance, right? Step-by-step, -step, hey, you should do this first, uh, you need to download this and make sure the settings are set to this and, you know, making sure that that guidance is also accessible. Pictures can be very helpful, having alt text, right, for images and things like that and 
having that step-by-step -step guidance. And uh, if you want to go further than that, having a Zoom call, like setting up a Zoom call meeting of all the new employees and then walking through those steps together. It's, it's very helpful. It, it, it saves a lot of time, especially for neurodivergent employees, because it's very hard for them to know what information is important and what is not, because I don't know this. The, it's, everything is new to me. Everything seems important to me. I, I feel like I'm missing, if I don't read this, if I don't click this, then I'm missing out. I'm going to be missing out super important information. And that's going to screw up my job or something like that. All these worries and anxieties. Having a bonding time, teammate bonding time uh, before starting a task when new employee joined is very important so that new employee feels more comfortable. Uh, rather than asking them to just set up one-on-one -on -one with different teammates and on their own, because that can be very anxiety provoking too, right? It's a new, per new team and I have to message different people and someone that I've never met and I need to uh, try to talk to them and it can be ner nerve wracking sometimes. So trying to have a, like a formal meetings set up uh, to include uh, the new team and, and uh, have them um, integrate into the team, um, helping them, uh, that would be really important. And lastly, I want to mention clearly mandating and uh, communicating that all meetings have to be recorded and should have captions on and a transcript available. So that especially uh, neurodivergent employees or uh, employees with mental health conditions can have not uh, unexpected uh, episodes, right, of, of mental health condition, or they might miss meetings or something like that. But if you miss meeting and, oh, like there's nothing, there's no recording, there's no transcript, there's no caption, then I have to go through all these uh, different people to ask around, oh, what did, what did they talk about and things like that to catch up. And that's very challenging, right? And, not, and it also kind of makes it very challenging for me to build my credibility as an employee as well, adds more ad additional uh, challenges to that. So making sure that all meetings are recorded, captions and transcripts available after the meeting so that if uh, um, employees who missed um, due to their uh, episode of disability, they can um, watch that recording. Or uh, for me as a neurodivergent employee, I oftentimes, even after attending the meeting, I need to watch the recording because I, I may not be able to process all the information in one setting and I might miss out a lot of information. And just having that uh, back of having the thoughts in back of my mind, thinking that, oh, the recordings will be available after this, it relieves huge anxiety from me. So that's uh, another um, really important tool that uh, uh, help me succeed at work. Thank you for sharing about this, Albert, because I think that these are easy things like the closed captioning and the recording and the transcriptions. They just take a little intention and effort, but can really help employees be able to show up for the organization and for themselves in a way that makes them feel good. Yes. Yes. I appreciate you sharing all your wisdom here. So many great nuggets of information. I'm going to include links to a number of resources as well as um, if somebody is listening here and they're like, I want to know more about what Albert does. We'll, we'll connect them to you directly uh, through LinkedIn. Do you have any, any last parting thoughts or maybe something you want to reinforce before we uh, end this podcast interview? Right. So I think last note I just want to mention is that making sure when you're building these policies and uh, practices, making sure that you include actual people with disabilities in that process, not just a provider actual people who are going through that struggle and challenges because they know the best. So uh, making sure that you listen to them, um, that's very important. So 
I just wanted to mention that. And if anyone uh, needs or wants to hear my insight or, uh, or um, my thoughts, uh, I'm more than happy to help as well. I'm available on LinkedIn and um, email as well. So uh, anyone can just reach out and I'm more than happy to help. Well, thank you again, Albert. I appreciate your time and expertise and just your willingness to share your story and what's working for you in this area. Thank you for having me. One thing I can say for certain is that the workplace has changed dramatically over the last two years and more people than ever have experienced or been diagnosed with mental health disabilities. Things like anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, ADHD, and more have come to light or were created by the global pandemic. It is so important for employers to be aware of invisible disabilities, what they are, how they work, what they look like, what they don't look like, and especially how we can support employees in a variety of ways to help them be successful. I so appreciate Albert's insights, his expertise, his honesty. This was an essential Workology podcast for you to listen to. And I want to thank our podcast series partner in this, Pete, for our Future of Work series. I can't do it without you. I also want to hear from you. You can text the word podcast to 512-548-3005. Ask me questions, leave comments, make suggestions for future podcast guests. This is my community text number, and I want to hear from you. Thank you for joining the Workology Podcast. It is sponsored by Upskill HR and Ace the HR Exam. These are HR certification and recertification courses that we offer here at Workology. I hope that you have a fantastic day. This podcast is for the disruptive workplace leader who's tired of the status quo. My name is Jessica Miller Merrill. And until next time, you can visit Workology.com to listen to all our Workology Podcast episodes.